I am Mohammed Amahamdan and this is Nightline, the headlines. Increase in water tariff decided after state requests, says Prime Minister. And MACC orders Mirzan Mahade to declare assets. Good morning. We'll begin with this headlining story. The government's decision on increasing water tariffs was based on requests from all states which require funds to improve water supply services and infrastructure for consumers. Prime Minister Datuk Seri Anwar Ibrahim said the government had agreed to the matter after careful deliberation. I sudah dijelaskan oleh semua pihak bahawa semua negeri meminta kita naikkan uh, dalam syarat uh, dengan Menteri Besar, Ketua Menteri um, dan uh, ada negeri yang tidak naikkan selama 40 tahun lebih dia mereka mengusulkan dan Kerajaan Persekutuan setuju. Anwar told this to the media at a press conference after attending the two-day Unity Government Cabinet Members Retreat in Cyberjaya on Thursday. On Wednesday, the National Water Services Commission, SPAN, announced the new water tariffs for domestic users in Peninsular Malaysia and Labuan, which will see an average increase of 22 cents per cubic meter, effective from February 1st. It said the adjustment could no longer be postponed to avoid jeopardizing the sustainability of the water services industry in the long term and affecting the quality of the water supply services enjoyed by the people. Meanwhile, Anwar, who is also the finance minister, said that the government has started dispersing funds to various agencies this month to expedite projects announced under the 2024 budget. Projects announced uh, during the budget should not wait for like the first, the normal process of the first quarter. I mean, should start now, which means uh, since we have achieved uh, a record. Uh, <coughs> achievement in the 2023 assessment of uh, projects implemented. I think for 2024, we want this to be uh, implemented fast, which means they can proceed now. Commenting on 2024 economic outlook, the Prime Minister said the main focus would be on political stability, followed by clarity of policies and expediting processes to bring in foreign investments. This also includes upskilling manpower and making improvements to the technical and vocational education and training TVET programs. On another matter, Anwar said the government will soon decide on the appointment of the new Employees Provident Fund EPF Chief Executive Officer to replace Dr. Sri Amir Hamza Azizan, who has been appointed as second finance minister during the cabinet reshuffle in December last year. Anwar also rubbish claims made in a viral video on Wednesday that Unity government MPs were being locked up in a location in Cyberjaya. He explained that cabinet members had only gathered for a retreat and could return to their homes after the meeting concluded. The Malaysian Anti-Corruption Commission, MACC, has confirmed that it summoned businessman Mirzan Mahade to its headquarters in Putrajaya to assist investigations into his asset ownership. The graphbuster said it also served Mirzan a notice under Section 36, Bracket 1, Bracket B of the MACC Act, requiring him to declare all movable and immovable assets in his possession. In a statement on Thursday, the MACC said that the assets, whether within or outside the country, must be declared within 30 days from the date of the notice. The Commission also said the notice was served after the son of the former Prime Minister, Tun Dr. Mahathi Mohamad, presented himself at the MACC headquarters at about 9.30 a.m. on Wednesday. This was a continuation of MACC's investigation into information from the Panama Papers report and Mirzan's business activities involving the sale and purchase of government-linked companies, GLCs. The MACC initiated the investigation in August 2022 as part of its probe into all entities mentioned in the Pandora Papers and Panama Papers reports. The investigation is still actively ongoing and is being conducted under the MACC Act, as well as the Anti-Money Laundering, Anti-Terrorism Financing and Proceeds of Unlawful Activities Act. To date, the MACC has called 10 individuals to have their statements recorded.
And in another case, three men believed to be the masterminds of a procurement cartel involving construction works at a Royal Malaysian Navy TLDM camp in Johor, valued at over 9 million ringgit, were detained by the MACC on Thursday. According to sources, the trio, aged between 28 and 47, were arrested at the Johor MACC office at 6 p.m. It is understood that the arrests were made on charges of false claims and being masterminds of the procurement cartel involving 13 supplier companies managing construction works at the camp. The sources said full payments had been made, but the construction has still not been completed satisfactorily. Johor MACC Director Dr. Azmi Alias confirmed the arrests. He said the case is being investigated under the MACC Act 2009. All suspects will be taken to the Johor Bahru Magistrates Court at 8.30 a.m. on Friday for a remand application. The young Dipertuan Agong Al Sultan Abdullah Riayatuddin Al Mustafa bin Lasha has decreed the Pahang government to prioritize the issue of environmental sustainability and should not be compromised in development planning. The king said the state government, in its efforts to find sources of state revenue, should continue to preserve environmental treasures so that they will last for generations to come. Kita jadikan Pahang sebagai negeri contoh pada negeri-negeri lain dalam hal-hal ESG ini. Kita jangan terlalu gila sangat dengan pembangunan tetapi biarlah secara sederhana dan secara, secara berperingkat-peringkat. Al Sultan Abdullah, who is also the Sultan of Pahang, said this in his royal address after the proclamation ceremony of Lipis as a national geopark at Taman Negara Sungai Relau on Thursday. The king also expressed concern that if there is no long-term planning, it will cause problems for future generations. The young Dipertuan Agung also said while the focus was on preserving the environment, town areas across Pahang should not be neglected, and the relevant parties in all districts must be careful when approving development projects in the state. The Lipis district was certified as the country's current largest national geopark, by the National Resources Environment and Climate Change Ministry on November 9th last year. The 5,408-square-kilometre Lipis Geopark encompasses the entire district, containing 28 geological heritage sites, 18 cultural sites and 6 biological heritage sites. In Perak, the state government will relocate an elderly woman living with her son in a deplorable unit at Taman Silibin Flat in Ipoh to a social welfare department, JKM Institution. Menteri Besar Datuk Sri Saharani Mohamad said that the Kinta Social Welfare Office had convinced the woman's son, Erwan Dahari, 46, to allow his mother, Miram Kadir, 77, to live in an institution under JKM. The JKM also offered Erwan to stay at Anjung Singah Pira, managed by the National Welfare Foundation, along with his mother. However, Erwan requested to stay in the flat, citing the reason as wanting to care for several cats. They allowed Erwan to stay there temporarily, but the house needed to be cleaned first. Earlier, the media reported that the family had been living in a home filled with trash and filth in the apartment for over seven years. Erwan, who is said to be suffering from depression, claimed that they only received assistance from Baitumal, amounting to 300 ringgit, and that amount was not sufficient to support them. On Wednesday, the State Women, Family, Social Welfare, Entrepreneur Development and Cooperative Development Committee Chairman Datuk Salbia Muhammad said that two forms of assistance will be approved, totaling 900 ringgit per month for the family. <coughs> Jangan pandang ringan dan mudah.
Well, back with news from the foreign front. Israeli ground troops killed dozens of fighters in close quarters combat Thursday as it intensified operations in Han Yunis, South Gaza's biggest city. The Zionist regime soldiers raided the martyrs outposts of Hamas's Han Yunis brigade and the offices of its commanders, seizing a weapons cache including AK-47 assault rifles and rocket-propelled grenades. Gaza's health ministry said 93 people had been killed overnight, including 16 in a strike on a house in the southern city of Rafah, where many people have fled. Those killed in the Rafah strike included women and children and 20 people were injured. In the meantime, a shipment of medical supplies and other aid for Israeli captives and Palestinian civilians has entered the Gaza Strip as part of an agreement mediated by Qatar and France between Israel and Hamas. According to the Palestinian Health Ministry, at least 24,620 Palestinians were killed and 61,830 wounded since the beginning of the Zionist rampage. In the meantime, the U.S. military has fired another wave of missile strikes against Houthi-controlled sites, marking the fourth time in a week that it has directly targeted the group in Yemen. The U.S. Central Command said the U.S. targeted 14 Houthi missile launches used to attack international shipping lanes. The strikes came after the Houthis struck a U.S.-owned and operated vessel hours earlier. The U.S. had also redesignated the Yemeni group as a terrorist organization in response to its continuing attacks. Now back home, Media Prima Berhad MPB through the Media Prima Palestinian Humanitarian Fund handed over 716,500 ringgit in contribution to the Malaysian Relief Agency, MRA, on Thursday. The donation will help support MRA's humanitarian initiatives to aid Palestinians in Gaza who have fallen victim to the Israeli military's atrocities. MPB Group Corporate Communication General Manager Aslan Abdulaziz handed over the contribution to MRA President Dr. Muhammad Daud Sulaiman at Anjong Riong Balai Berita in Kuala Lumpur on Thursday. The donation would be used to purchase medicine, food and water, as well as other emergency assistance and winter aid for the Palestinians due to the destruction of their homes. Bantuan musim sejuk. Itu pada kami adalah critical sebab banyak runtuhan, banyak kemusnahan. Uh, jadi uh, mereka perlukan pelindungan. Jadi kalau tidak dapat pelindungan program shelter ni makan masa. Jadi kita perlukan bantuan pakaian musim sejuk, bantuan uh, misalnya uh, selimut ya. To date, the MRA has received donations totaling 2.4 million ringgit from the Malaysian public, and these funds have been directed to support the residents of Gaza. Pakistan on Thursday has hit Iran with what it described as highly coordinated military strikes, further raising tensions between the neighbors and sparking fears of a broader conflict. According to a statement from its foreign affairs ministry, Pakistan conducted what it called an intelligence-based operations against hideouts of armed groups in the Sistan Balochistan province of Iran. Following the attacks, Iranian media reported that several missiles hit a village in the province, killing at least nine people. Iran's foreign ministry had also summoned the senior most Pakistani diplomat in Tehran to offer explanations for the attacks. The Pakistani response followed Iran's attack on Tuesday on Pakistani soil that killed two children in the southwestern Balochistan province. In other news, Indonesian presidential candidate Prabowo Subianto held a commanding lead but was stagnating in popularity just a few weeks out from next month's election, raising the chance of a second round runoff in June. The latest survey by Indicator Politik on Thursday showed that despite a huge 20-point lead, Prabowo is no closer to the more than 50% of the vote required to win in a single round. 
Previously, the December 30th to January 6th survey showed the former Special Forces commander had the support of 45.8% of the 1,200 respondents, with 25.5% backing former Jakarta governor Anis Baswedan, while the ruling party's Ganja Pranowo was the top choice of 23% of respondents. The world's third largest democracy will hold an election on February 14th. However, if no candidate secures votes from more than half of the 205 million eligible voters, a runoff will be held on June 26. <laughs>the victory moved 2015 champions Australia to six points, while Syria have one point from two games. In another match, Ali al Bulay scored the winner in stoppage time as Saudi Arabia came back from a goal down to defeat Oman 2-1 in their Group F opener. Oman took an early lead in Roberto Mancini's side through a Salah al Yahya penalty in the 14th minute. Saudi Arabia, however, leveled the score in the 78th minute thanks to a strike by Abdul Rahman Bari. Al Boulay then stunned Oman when he scored the winner from a corner six minutes into added time to help Saudi Arabia claim the full three points. In Group A, Qatar became the first team to book a place in the knockout stage after a 1 0 win against Tajikistan. The only goal of the match came in the 17th minute when Akram Afif finished off a clever through ball, giving the hosts the maximum three points.
the defending champion second win, coupled with China and Lebanon playing to a goalless draw earlier in the day, means Qatar are assured of finishing as the Group A winners. After this short break, senior citizen claims trial to three charges of reckless, dangerous driving. Don't go away. In Terengganu, the Kuala Terengganu court complex was vacated earlier following a bomb-like threat when a package was placed in front of the complex's gate. Terengganu Police Chief Datuk Mazli Mazlan said they received a report from the security personnel at the complex at 7.30 a.m., informing them of the discovery of the package at 6.45 a.m. As a result of the report, a team of police officers from the Kuala Terengganu Police Headquarters Criminal Investigation Department and the Terengganu Police Bomb Disposal Unit rushed to the scene. Dan kita telah membuat pemeriksaan dan dan terdapat dalam bungkusan itu yang dibalut dengan kertas uh, EFO uh, mengandungi bateri. Uh, bateri dan disaki uh, ada cepisan apa ni cepisan uh, lampu sulu. Dan kita telah mengambil tindakan telah memusnahkan barang tersebut dan didapati tidak ada unsur-unsur letupan dan sebagainya. Dan apa ini, barang kes tersebut telah di dikolek dan juga telah dihantar ke polisi lah untuk buat apa ini, penilaian forensik. He added that there were no other threatening elements found at the location, but police will conduct patrols and monitoring around the area as a precautionary measure. The case is being investigated under the penal code for criminal intimidation. In Pulau Pinang, a senior citizen was charged at the magistrate's court in Georgetown on Thursday with three counts of driving at dangerous speed and knocking into three motorcycles two months ago. 76-year-old Tan Liuk Lei claimed trial to all three charges which were read to her before Magistrate City Nurul Suhaila Baharin. The offences were allegedly committed at Jalan Bukit Gambir at about 2.15 p.m. on November 27th last year. All the charges were framed under the Road Transport Act 1987. The offence carries a penalty of up to five years in jail and a fine of between 5,000 ringgit and 15,000 ringgit upon conviction. 
Deputy Public Prosecutor Nurul Atika Asharaf Ali asked a court to set bail at 10,000 ringgit for each of the offence. The court then set March 8th for submission of documents and medical report. It was reported that five people were injured in a crash involving seven vehicles in Jalan Bukit Gambir on the afternoon of November 27th. The crash involved four cars and three motorcycles. In Johor, a disagreement is believed to be the cause of a fight involving a group of men in front of a restaurant in Banda Baru Permas Jaya, Johor Baru, last Monday. Johor Baru South District Police Chief Assistant Commissioner Raup Salamat said that five local male suspects were arrested in raids at four separate locations around Johor Baru on Tuesday and Wednesday. This after a police report regarding the incident was lodged at 2.27 p.m. on Tuesday. Acting on information, a police team arrested five men aged between 17 and 43. During the arrest, police seized two rattan sticks and two mobile phones. A check of past records found that a suspect has three criminal and drug cases. All the suspects tested negative for drugs. They were remanded for a day and the case was investigated according to the penal code. And lastly, an Arab eatery in Georgetown, Pulau Pinang, is among three food premises ordered to close for 14 days following the discovery of red droppings in the storage store section. In addition to that, there was also cross-contamination of foods which were placed on printed pa paper with uncooked and cooked foods stored together. In the operation by the State City Council, MBPP, which started at the famous Arabic food restaurant located in Lebo Chulia, including a closure order for 14 days until January 30th. Ketiga-tiga premis yang kita jalankan tindakan penutupan memang ada najis tikus dan juga kencing tikus lah dan tahap kebersihan uh, kedai makanan tersebut amat uh, tidak memuaskan, sangat teruk. Kita jumpa pencemaran silang di mana bahan makanan mentah yang belum dimasak diletakkan sekali dengan makanan yang telah dimasak. During the inspection, the police found other food placed with paint and detergent. Further inspection also found the level of cleanliness in the kitchen, in the cooking area, to be in unsatisfactory condition. The eatery's management also failed to show the employees anti-typhoid vaccine record. In a separate inspection, a Nasikanda outlet and an Indian cuisine restaurant in Pulau Tikus were also given a closure notice following the discovery of rat droppings in the kitchen. Both premises have received several compounds recently, but it was found that there was no change or action taken by the owners. Nightline draws were closed this time around, but before we leave, let's take a look as a Croatian artist employs 210,000 matchsticks to build a life-size sculpture of a pianist playing a grand piano, complete with matchstick strings. With that, I'm Muhammad Mohamed, and thanks for tuning in, and be well, Malaysia.